Okay, so thank you so much uh, for the invitation, first of all. I'd like to thank the organizers. It's uh, extremely pleasure to be uh, at uh, Trieste and also to ICTP. Um, and well, today I'm going to talk about uh, integra integral models, integrability, versus the some kind of theory, but gauge theory. And, and of course, there are various different dis differences. In fact, there are so many differences in the literature uh, about. Oh, okay, I have to turn. Oh, I see. Yes. Yes. And then turn it on. Right. Okay. It's better. Yeah. Hopefully, I can. You can hear. So, uh, so there is a relation between integrability and gauge series, and there are various uh, proposals in the literature. Uh, but quite often, people use the integrability to try to solve the gauge theory. It's something like there is a gauge theory. It's complicated things, but maybe you specialize to some particular sector, or you, you take some special gauge theory, topological gauge theory, etc. And then, uh, there is some, and then there is some integrable structure there, so you try to take advantage of that to solve the gauge theory, for example. So that's that, that roughly uh, in this direction, uh, trying to use the integrability to solve gauge theory, uh, which is a very interesting thing, uh, except that uh, mostly what I'm going to talk about is the opposite direction. So namely, I'm going to use the gauge theory or quantum field theory as a tool to understand whatever is known uh, about various integral models in the literature. So that's the direction uh, I want to go. And uh, well, let's see. So then what aspect of integrable models I want to understand? Well, uh, today I want I'd say that I want to understand minimally the young baxter equation, which I call YBE, uh, with the spectral parameter. Um, right, so this is what uh, I, I want to understand. Well, there are other ingredients. Uh, but it, I think it's often the case that one of the, this young baxter equation is the definition of integrability, although there are several different uh, definitions of integrable models, but this, I think, is the, one of the canonical ones, so I want to understand these particular equations. Well, so uh, for what I understand means that, uh, well, sometimes you might want to construct new solutions, uh, but also sometimes people find solutions for certain cases, but, but people haven't, haven't found the solution in some cases. So we want to explain the pattern of what is known about the Ambach's equations in the literature. So the, these are the things I want to do, uh, starting with gauge theory. Now, uh, here I emphasize the fact that I'm going to think about the Young-Bach's equation with a spectral parameter. And that, that's important because uh, that's really a crucial part of the story. So it's likely that most people are very familiar with the Young-Bach's equation itself. But uh, ju just to uh, remind you what Young-Bach's equation was. So, Young box equation, so there is some operator R. Uh, so it's endomorphism of some vector space B. Uh, so it has, in, in a sense, it has four indices, say IJKL, for example. IJKL, if you, if you choose a basis uh, of this uh, vector space. Say it's a big vector space, it's going to be in some representation of some group, for example. Say SU2, spin J representation. So th th this is this uh, uh, vector space B. And, and then, uh, so this is the operator. And then I consider uh, the three tensor products of vector space B times B times B. And, uh, and then on this space, I could define the R matrix. Uh, let's see, so I, I could, uh, so this R itself is endomorphism of B times B. Uh, but for example, I could take R12, which is the uh, R acting on the first two times the identity on the third component, for example. So this is endomorphism B times B times B. And similarly, I could define 1, 3, 2, 3, for example. And, and the celebrated young box equation says that, uh, that we have this uh, equation. Well, it's important, so let's write here so that we, everybody can see uh, 1, U. Uh, sorry, OK, I'm going to write this afterwards. And uh, R23 is equal to R23, R13, R12. So this is the identity. So this is the element of the endomorphism. So you can take a product, compose it, and, uh, and this is the uh, equation. 
Now, so the, well, this is, so in, in, some, in some cases, people are really interested in this, this type of equation. Uh, but I need a little bit extra ingredient, uh, which is a spectral parameter. Oh, there is a color choke, so I'm tempted to use it. So uh, in my case, what happens is that there is a one parameter, family of R metrics. Uh, there is a, R metrics is a functional parameter. Uh, and this is the par spectral parameter. I might like it Z, for example, sometimes, or U. Uh, so, and then uh, there is a, uh, the equation here. Well, in general, actually, it depends on the two parameters. Uh, but uh, here, imposing a condition that it depends on only on the difference. So that's one parameter, uh, if you care about such details. But anyway, for the, for the most typical case, it's just one parameter. Now, uh, then, then there is a parameter here, U, U plus B, and B. And then uh, these are u plus p, u, for example. So that's an interesting uh, equation uh, where th there's a particular pattern in the argument. And so this is the Young box equation with the spectral parameter. And uh, it's, well, so one interesting question is whether you can find a solution to this. And uh, if you don't know anything about the integral models, the, the most brute force way I, I would do it's just like the order of components of the matrix, for example. Say, for example, if ijk runs over two indices, for example, I, that, that has two to the fourth power, 16. Uh, uh, well, let's see, anyway, there are many components. So, uh, and then write down the components and then just write down the equation and try to solve it. That's the most naive thing to do, except that then you immediately realize that uh, it's not easy to find a solution because this is an uh, over-constrained solution. Well, for example, if this index i, j, k, et cetera, runs from 1 to n, this gives order n to the 6 power equations. But our matrix itself, it has only four indices, r to the four, n to the fourth power, for example. So it's highly over-constrained. So it's very uh, hard to find a solution. And uh, if you do a linear algebra, for example, unless there is some miracle and then there is some linear dependency between these equations, you won't find a solution. <laughs> But uh, that, that miracle happens, and then that interesting question of why that miracle happens. And the question is to understand that miracle from uh, gauge theory. Well, of course, this is not the only approach. People try to take advantage of symmetry. For example, one approach is to take advantage of symmetry, and uh, people use the quantum groups and other symmetries, uh, which I sometimes come to. But, but I, I'm working on a few theories. I want to understand hopefully everything in gauge theory language. Now, why is this equation important? Uh, because it's related with the uh, existence of conserved charges, uh, which is another characterization of integral models. So suppose that I have this R matrix. Then I could define a statistical mechanical model. Well, here I define a classical statistical mo mechanical model defined on a two-dimensional lattice. So, so there is a two-dimensional plane. And uh, there is a statistical lattice. And well, for example, for the simplest case, let's take uh, the, the square lattice. And uh, as, let's also assume that, uh, the, that it's a torus, for example, uh, periodic boundary conditions. Sorry, this is supposed to be on the boundary, for example. The order list is supposed to be uh, a lattice, for example. And then uh, you can define a statistical partition function by associating a factor of r uh, to each factor. So what you do is that uh, you associate this spectral parameter. Well, OK, first of all, r dependent on the spectral parameter. So you could have to associate, for example, the same spectral parameter uh, u and uh, let's see. For example, I could associate the same spectral parameter u here, etc. cetera. Uh, and, and then uh, it, once you see this intersection, you associate this R matrix here, which has four indices. And then uh, when, you, when you connect these uh, uh, four, four valent vertices, you're going to sum over the corresponding indices. So namely, if you have this, for example, IJKL, for example, I would say that there is a, a Boltzmann weight IJKL, for example. But now suppose that there is a, a well, okay, PQRS, for example. And then I, I'm going to also associate PQRS. But when we connect these things together, I'm going to make identification that S equals to J. Uh, so this S is replaced by J. So take a product and, and sum over the J. 
So each time, so you, you start everything, the, you associate the R matrix to each vertex, and you're going to connect the, uh, everything together, and each time you connect it, you sum over the corresponding uh, index. And by repeating that, you obtain something, so every, eventually you contract all the indices, and you define the partition function. So this is a torus. Yes, in this case, it's a torus. And if you want to, so, so you can also try to have the boundary condition, like a fixed boundary condition, et cetera, on the boundary. Well, in, that, in those cases, you have to make sure that integrability is preserved on the boundary, boundary condition. And there is a reflection, uh, like for example, K matrix, there is a similar equation involving. You have to take into account the uh, effective boundary, and then there is a boundary generalization of the Ambach's equation, for example. So, uh, so this defines a uh, so 2D two dimensional statistical lattice model. And once you have the statistical mechanical model, uh, so this is just the definition. But uh, what's crucial is here is that this Yambax equation guarantees, the, guarantees that this, uh, uh, the commute, commute, well, let's see. Uh, should I explain this? OK. Well, maybe I just state the fact. So uh, from here, so this is the, the true partition function. But for example, you can, instead of computing everything at vertex, you can try to first compute this part. And then uh, take a, uh, uh, and then combine everything together to form the whole two-dimensional lattice. So namely, you might want to first compute this thing, namely single layer, where because of the periodic boundary condition, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's identified. So this is a transfer matrix. And then suppose that there's a, a spectral parameter here. So this is known as a transfer matrix. And the partition function, and then uh, the power of this uh, thing, where this L is the length in this direction. And the crucial point is the Yambach equation means that these two transfer matrices commute two transfer matrices with different uh, spectral parameters commute. And hence, uh, you can expand TU in U to, and because everything commutes for arbitrary values U and V, you can expand. And the coefficient should also mutually commute. So uh, if you expand, like uh, T, T, TN, UN, for example, then they, they, should, mutually, they should mutually commute. So that, that's another characterization of integral bonvosos that they are uh, mutually commuting charges. So for this reason, well, the, what's crucial is that you need a spectral parameter u to do this expansion. If you don't have, if you have a solution of the Yambach equation without this u, you do not necessarily have this conclusion because you simply cannot expand in u. Right. So this is the well-known uh, uh, well stuff in the. Uh, in the integrable models. But the reason I, I spend some time explaining this is it's actually, there, there, although there are a lot of literature uh, about trying to use gauge theory to understand some aspect of integral models, there has been a long standing question of how to understand spectral parameter in gauge theory. And, uh, well, I'm going to explain a little bit more later, but before coming to details, uh, well, first of all, we, we have the Yambach's equation with a spectral parameter. And there are several different approaches to this. And uh, I have tried several different things over the past uh, five years or so. And what I'm going to talk about today is uh, one approach uh, which uses uh, four-dimensional gauge theory. Well, so this is somewhat like a Chan Simons like theory, but in four dimensions. And this approach has been uh, pro well, first proposed by Costero in, I think, 13. <coughs> it is a very interesting paper. Uh, 
And uh, so we are trying to take advantage of the, the full power of his understanding. And uh, so there is, uh, what I'm going to talk about is based mostly in work in progress uh, with uh, Kevin Costero and uh, Robert Digra. Uh, and everything. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And well, before, before talking about that, let's also mention that there are several other things I have tried. Another approach to this, uh, in fact, that, that's what I talked about uh, here in this, in, in this exactly the same room three years ago, in fact. Uh, but I, I know that there isn't too much overlap, so <laughs> I'm not going to assume anything. Uh, and, and also, I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I'm now writing a review about this uh, whole stuff, which is supposed to be very pedagogical. So uh, if you're interested, uh, please have a look once it comes out. But anyway, so the, the another approach is here, I'm going to use the four-dimensional, uh, well, not necessarily four-dimensional, uh, use is the, the other idea is, is to use supersymmetric uh, fever gauge theory. And uh, this approach I call the gauge, gauge YBE because it's a relation between uh, Jan Baxter equation and gauge theory. And well, I intentionally wrote the Suji gauge theory somewhat vaguely because there are actually several different versions you can do with this. Uh, the original story I worked on was 4D n equal 1, for example. Uh, but you can also go to 3D and then 2D, for example. Uh, 2 comma 2, for example. And, uh, right, so that, that's, and then, uh, well, what's interesting about this story is that since, well, first of all, the main idea here is that there's a young Baxter equation. So what is the counterpart of that here? Uh, well, the simple answer is that it corresponds to some duality, which I call the young Baxter duality. Uh, so it's a duality among, uh, among uh, quantum field series, uh, Kuiper gauge series. So young Baxter equation promoted the duality. But this is very nice because once you promote it to a duality, you can compute various different partition functions, for example. And then it, you can obtain various different answers, for example. It's just that one answer, but sometimes, for example, in, in the case, difficult case I worked on, is that originally I started working on S1 times S3, but there are also supersymmetric but localized partition function, uh, which is sometime ago I computed with uh, Francesco and also Tatsuma Nishioka. Uh, so I, I also computed these observables and then we obtained different solutions of the Baxter equation. So it's actually, you, like, you, you could obtain new solutions. And uh, that new solution is a, it's supposed to contain all the known solution of the star triangle relation uh, with the positive Boltzmann weight. And it's a crazy generalization of the Ising model with many parameters, continuous spins, discrete spins, etc. And, uh, and it involves, for example, well, function-wise, this involves the, some special function of the elliptic gum function. And, it, well, you can take various degeneration limits. There is a quantum dialog, a four comma symbol. Oh, there you can go to gamma functions. Well, a gamma function case is a little bit subtle, but, but okay. Yeah, sure, there is an expression involving gamma functions, theta functions. Um, so there are various special functions up here. And uh, so there is a very nice structure here. Well, so I, I'm very fascinated by the story, except that uh, by talking with people, I realized that this is not necessarily the type of the integral models which people mostly encounter. So namely, these are solutions typically uh, not quasi-classical. So what does quasi-classical mean? Well, quasi-classical means that there is some parameter, expansion parameter like h bar uh, for this R matrix. So if you have this R matrix RU, for example, but suppose it has expansion parameter H bar. And then uh, suppose that it starts its identity and first order, it's, it's let's write it a small R plus for the H bar squared. So in, in some cases, there is a nice expansion parameter around which you start its identity and then expand. Uh, it's one to the first order and the second order, etc. And in the, in, in, if there is such a parameter, the solution is called the quasi-classical, for example. 
Well, so, but many of the solutions are not quasi classical, whereas uh, many, many people in the literature encounter quasi classical solutions. So uh, I'm not completely producing some of many of the things people, the most standard stuff people are discussing. Now, here in this approach, uh, I'm, I'm going to, well, uh, well, not this, well th these are particularly useful uh, for seeing the uh, can see quasi classical solutions. Uh, solution. And in fact, it's useful to, for, to see the classification of the quasi classical solutions, as we will see. Or well, maybe I'm going too slow. Yeah, okay. Yes. 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 Right. So, do you have any idea why? Well, any idea why? Well, uh, from from the viewpoint of integrable models, for example. I mean, from the viewpoint of integral models, it's very hard to see that uh, because uh, it looks like a completely different integral models. And unless you know the underlying gauge theory, it's very hard to see. Well, except that there might be a different answer of the different type, which is like maybe there is an underlying geometrical structure, uh, algebra, algebraic structure like a quantum group. It might be the same, for example. For, for example, uh, these, uh, these are associated, as you know, with the uh, scrying algebra, for example. And, uh, well, I don't really know this uh, S3 mod gamma case, but, uh, but if given a spec scrying algebra, you can try to change the representations, for example. So maybe it, it, it might be that changing the representation might correspond to changing the geometry. Or maybe we are identifying the new, even new structure, for example. For each form of there might be new algebraic structure, for example. That would be more fascinating, but uh, I don't necessarily know because I, well, the, the, I definitely see that, that the quantum group or elliptic group type structure here, but not necessarily directly uh, so far in this approach. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're right. Uh, well, so you are talking about the one by uh, Odesky, for example, uh, Begin Odesky. Well, sorry, but Felder doesn't necessarily have this R, for example. Yeah. So that's right. Why I'm yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. So I, I do. I don't know, but I do suspect that uh, this might be a new algebraic structure underlying behind that. So if, if you know, if, so this at least can be defined for S L N, and it has two deformation parameter. So these are continuous parameters, like a Q of the quantum group, plus the integer, R, for example. Yes, so that's a discrete parameter. And maybe it might be a new, completely new algebraic structure. That would be very fascinating. And to some extent, we already know the R metrics. And in some simple cases, given the R metric, you can define algebra easily. But this R matrix, the complicated R matrix, uh, whose in indices are continuous parameters, for example. So uh, standard method doesn't necessarily work. So. Uh, but anyway, I think there is a lot to understand, even mathematically, about because these are concrete solutions. Uh, it goes through quantum field theory, but the resulting solution is very concrete. And and uh, uh, and well, first I should say that what the spectral parameter is. So in this approach, spectral parameter becomes uh, in this approach, as we will see, a position, well, geometric position on surface. Surface, which I write C, and uh, here in this case, it's actually related to some U on R symmetry uh, in supersymmetric gauge theory, and and uh, so namely there is a U on R symmetry in the U I R could mix with the Freiberg symmetries, so there is mixing, and there is a parameter space, and uh, and that type of things, yeah, is related with the spectral. Uh, well, in fact, sorry, uh, the U on R symmetry and the I R, I should have said right, is related to the spectral parameter, and. Well, so there, there are some indication questions about how to relate this, and I have some thoughts, uh, but uh, I won't say any, anything today, at least. And uh, well, of course, even R symmetry typically in the brain realization is a rotation in the transverse direction. So that's also geometrical, so there might be relations. And uh, in fact, since, since I'm, I started saying this, there is another, there is another thing I tried, uh, which I might like A, because it's a sort of sort of different category. So. Uh, what, another approach is to try to use the scattering amplitude. Uh, of uh, of Prana scattering amplitude. 
of 4DN equal 4 and 3D ABGM theory, N equal 6 ABGM theory. So in this type of approach, whenever there is a, for example, well, that's exactly the case in ABGM, where there is a line, I really regard it as a crossing of particles, for example, gluons. And, and, then, uh, and then there is some interesting spectral param There is a, a nice structure. And in particular, the, the R matrix, the one consequence on this is that R matrix is, has written it as an integral, as Grassmannian integral. Uh, because people are trying to write the scattering amplitude in terms of the Grassmannians. Uh, so interestingly, some of the R matrices for a uh, young for PSU2 to thrust 4, or SP2, uh, to comma 2 thrust 6, so 6 thrust 2 comma 2, uh, has nice uh, uh, Grassmannian formula, for example. Although in this case, uh, unfortunately, the meaningful spectral parameter is like a deforming the helicity, and the physical meaning isn't completely clear. So, Let's uh, try to describe the, the, this theory, uh, Postero's theory. And Costero goes through, the, goes through a series chain of arguments, starting with 4 dn equal 1 super mills, and then uh, do the twist, giving a master fermions, uh, except that uh, after all, uh, the resulting thing, the, what is crucial is a very simple, and uh, well, let's consider four dimensions. Well, first let's write on the action, and then try to explain. And then this is the sigma times c, and uh, and then there is a, a dz, which Sean Simon's a. So this is a very simple action. So let me explain the notation. So first of all. First of all, what's crucial is that uh, 4D geometry is always of the form lima surface times lima surface. So this is where the spectral curve lives. So I said the geometrical surface, but this actually is C. The C oh, I wrote over there. So this is where the spectral parameter lives. And, and, and this is another surface which I could take, for example, for T2, for example. So this is the, uh, the surface where integral lattice model lives. And let's take the coordinates uh, to be uh, x, y for the first uh, sigma. And then there is a complex parameter, which I was uh, writing z here. So this is a complex parameter. So say, let's write the real part and the imaginary part as uh, t minus t and theta, for example. I, I will not use that, that often, but the z, z and z bar. So in particular, I have assumed that this is a complex manifold. So there's a complex structure here. And, and uh, well, it actually turns out that the theory is topological. In the, so, so we need a holomorphic structure here on this uh, Neiman surface. Uh, in fact, already here, I already needed that. And here, uh, the theory is topologi uh, topological along this surface. I, did, I didn't use any metric here like for writing down this action. Now, this itself is already actually very interesting because, because typically in Chan Simon theory, you want to do the Chan Simon theory. Say, let's start with the 3D Chan Simon theory, what people are more familiar with. And in that case, you wanted to define a 3D Chan Simon theory on three, an arbitrary 3 manifold. And that was actually crucial for understanding not divided because there is a 3D covariance. So the original motivation of Witten was that there is a, a Jones polynomial, but that's defined by projections. And somehow, not series could see that it's independent of the way its projection is done, but that becomes completely trivial uh, in Chan Simon's formulation. And that was the power of the 3D covariance. So that's a, what's every, very crucial for application to not theory. Here, I'm using a different thing. So I'm now, I don't necessarily have the covariance in three manifold or four manifold in this case. And I just restricted the geometry to this case. In fact, that's a little bit of a trick. Uh, 
fit by hindsight is very simple, but uh, so you need to change the mindset a little bit to in order to discuss integral models with our young box equation with suspect parameter, uh, so, uh, so that as compared with uh, discussion of not invariance. Right, and then so what's this a? Well, a chance a is well. What's also there is funny is that this a <coughs> is a connection, of course, but uh, we actually don't use the uh, some of the components of this uh, connection. A z bar, d z bar. So no a z. Well, no a z doesn't mean that we, we are fixing the case so that a z equal to zero. That would break the case symmetry. But a lot of what I'm doing is that uh, the value of a z is unspecified, and I'm, I'm not really using that to write down this action. Now, the Charles Simons A is the standard Charles Simons term action. Charles Simons action, AHDA uh, plus cubic, uh, cubic terms. So, if you like, you can integrate the parts, and uh, I think uh, there is a factor two, I guess, uh, like uh, Z, uh, FHA, for example. FHF, sorry. So, this is by integral of parts. So, this is like a theta angle, uh, but the theta angle depends on the complex parameter z. And also, for example, the parameter here, h bar, one of h bar, rot h bar, so this h bar obviously plays the role of the Planck constant, but it's not necessarily quantized. So in the 3D chance summary, it was quantized. That was a level. And that was because, well, one way to explain that was, in fact, we did similar operations like this. So in that case, there's a chance sum of sum uh, on the defined on the three fold, three manifold. But uh, for that, you need a trivialization of the gauge field, which doesn't necessarily exist. So you do integral parts. If the, you can do the integral parts if the three manifold is the boundary of the four manifold, and to write it in the boundary of four manifold, but it depends on the ch uh, choice of the four manifolds. So that's why uh, this level was quantized. But here, all the fields are already defined on the four manifold. Um, so that's this uh, Lagrangian. Is there anything else I should explain? Right, DZ, John Simons. Right. So I'm going to consider a slightly generalized version of this momentarily. But this is the simplest case. So it's extremely simple action. Now, now the question is, uh, what does it help? Well, um, Just like ordinary Chan Simon theory, we attempted to compute observables. And for the comp and the good observable is the Wilson line. So in the case of the compact group well, usual Chan Simon theory, uh, the Wilson line gives like not invariant, so we attempted to do similar things. But first of all, we have this product geometry. So we have to think about which direction the Wilson line spreads. Now, we have to be careful with the fact that there isn't really a z. So in the usual way to define the uh, Wilson line, you have to do the parallel transport using the gauge connection to, uh, to compute the holonomy and then take a trace. However, there isn't really no a z. So you cannot really transport in the direction of z. So what you want to do, what you, I'm, at least I'm going to do, is to consider a Wilson line here on this frame. And let's take this to be T2, for example, elliptic curve. Uh, so remember, this is supposed to be where the lattice model lives. So depending on what kind of boundary conditions uh, you want for the statistical mechanical model, you might have to think about different uh, surfaces. Say you, it might be a disk if you want the boundary condition. Then you have to think about the boundary condition of this. 
But let's say you have a torus, for example, so that the resulting statistical mechanical model is the, has periodic boundary conditions. And let's do the similar, well, and then what I want is the exactly the same picture, which I wrote uh, 10, 20 minutes ago. Which was this picture. Right. But now, uh, the meanings are slightly different. Well, first of all, maybe I should orient these. So these are the Wilson lines. So each of these becomes the Wilson lines. So this is a, this is a sigma, which is a which, which is along which the theory is topological. So I might call it topological frame. Now, now there was a parameter. Well, let's see. First of all, if it's a line, then it should have be at a particular point on this surface. So. The whole geometry is this times the surface. C, uh, well, the curve C, uh, except that in this particular case, this surface C is taken to be a complex plane, as, as this Z. Z is a complex coordinate, for example. Well, I'm going to comment on the generalizations momentarily, but this is the simplest case. So there is an infinity. Uh, but, uh, and then it has a fixed point. So for example, this used to have a spectral parameter, for example. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, parameters uh, like uh, z, say let's say w, for example. And these are located at point z and w. Well, you can try to change the positions if, if you like. Uh, but these are located at different positions. So. The idea is pretty simple. So there was an unknown parameter, but that was turned into the coordinate of the extra dimension. And this z and w should play the role of the spectral parameter. Well, except that there, are, there could be various objections to this. So, uh, well, okay, so at least the statement one might want is that I consider the expectation value of these Wilson lines uh, representing the statistical lattice, and then compute the expectation value. And then that reproduces the statistical partition function of the integrable models. That's the type of things. But there are many things. Well, first of all, why it's integrable? But even before coming to that, it's not even clear why this is the statistical mechanical model in the sense I'm explaining. So namely, in general, well, in the statistical mechanical model I mentioned, everything comes from the local interaction at the vertex. So anyway, uh, there isn't a long-range uh, interaction uh, between, the, between the variables here and between the variable there. So, uh, so you have to make sure that uh, whatever is your computing here, after I factorize it into con local contribution from here. Once you know that, it becomes closer to the, the statistical mechanical model I was talking about. Now, let's see. Now, now there is one peculiar, not yet another peculiar feature of this theory, um, which is that this theory, so cost, uh, which I tend to call Costello theory, very, very interesting. This is power counting, unnormalizable. Well, because if you don't have this, this in three dimensions, that was the usual Chan Simon stuff, but you have this extra coordinate dz. So, well, it depends on how you normalize this. Uh, but if you keep the canonical dim no, no, uh, dimension for the gauge field, there is a dimension full parameter here. It makes the story pa theory power counting unrenormalized, non renormalizable, which looks bizarre. However, well, this is a nice theory. And in particular, due to the equation of motion, all the counter terms which you can think of. Uh, gauge invariant counter terms actually vanish because the, the equation motion is like basically f equals to zero. So, uh, so it actually doesn't make much, too, too much trouble that it's, the theory is not power counting unrenormalizable. And, and Kevin Costello has an amazing uh, story of trying to define, use, use the battery Minkowski formalism to define really mathematical rigorously part of the quantum field theory. And he has shown that this theory is uh, 
um, is, uh, is finite, except that please don't ask me why, because some of the arguments I still don't understand. <laughs> Yeah, but anyway, but anyway, you can already see that uh, the usual problem associated with the counter term, it's, it's not there. And also, well, if you're a little skeptic about, uh, about this, for example, there's actually a realization of this starting for four dimensional n equal one super fermions, and, and then try to give a twist theory giving a master fermions, et cetera, and that will give a UV completion to this theory. So if you like, I, I could rely on that, and, uh, uh, and that, that itself should, is fine. Okay, but anyway, the reason I said that this bound quantity is only normalizable is that the theory uh, becomes IR free. So long distance physics is trivial. So suppose that I have this uh, complicated set of Wilson lines and then try to do the perturbation following the usual rules of quantum field theory. And what I do is that, well, there are gluons here, and gluons here, and gluons here, etc. Uh, I have to think about all sorts of gluon exchange. And there, are, there might be loop diagrams, etc., uh, which you have to think about. Well, except that the fact that it's a theory is uh, uh, trivial in the long distance means that you really don't have to think about uh, the gluon exchange uh, from, uh, from here to there, which is far away. So this means that the non-trivial effect should come from the local intersection uh, between, uh, between these two Wilson lines. Right, so here on this, on this surface, it literally, it literally crosses. <coughs> so there is a gluon exchange. And if you go to higher loop order, there are more complicated loop diagrams, et cetera. Uh, that will be a more complicated story, but the, still the fact that there is a local contribution associated to this vertex uh, is fine. So that explains why this partition function, which in principle everything is uh, glued together, it, it, well, entangled together in a very complicated manner, factorizes into local contributions uh, from this vertex. So this is a very interesting explanation. In fact, in the other story of supersymmetric gate theory I talked about, similar localization come from supersymmetric localization bosons of fermions, cancellations, etc. So one loop exact. So that's the, that's the explanation there, but here we have a different explanation. Sorry, that's a comment, uh, maybe I shouldn't. Um, so, well, now, once you have this thing, then, then you can try to compute it. Simply, just do the loop computation, one loop, well, three loop, one loop, two loop, to, uh, com to compute the R matrix. And, uh, and then, well, we call that there's, these are associated, located at point Z and W, so that should give the R matrix. And it turns out this only depends on the difference. Well, which is not too surprising here because <laughs> there is a translation symmetry. So in this case, Z, the only, it depends only on the difference. So if you do the loop computation, that should give this one. Well, but it's still a hard problem, as we know in quantum field series, because loop computation is hard. So the first thing we should do is to try the simplest, namely to do the tree level. Uh, so which is this diagram. So what is the tree level answer? So at tree level, So it's the first leading order in H bar expansion. So, so namely, if you have this R H bar of Z minus W, but then I might write this identity plus H bar R Z minus W. And, and what is this? Oh, R itself. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, yeah, so that, that's going to be the correlator of two Wilson lines. Okay. Yes, at an angle here, yes. Right, so then we, right, so, right, so the point is that here, there are a lot of different observables and then they might interpret each other, but we can forget about the uh, interactions among them, just concentrate on the, uh, so it's a sort of a factorization of the correlation function of the Wilson lines, yes. So what is this going to be? Well, you still have to do the, trans uh, do the integral. You write down the propagator and then do the integral. So there is a gluon 
and there are positions here and there, you have to integrate over all the possible positions. But uh, except that, uh, uh, but you, you really don't, don't, well, but here, let me explain the slightly different way. So namely, if you have this structure, or maybe do I want uh, here, let's see, ij, okay, either is fine. Uh, but let's see, okay, my, well, it should be fine. Yeah, so sure, for example. So let's, want, let's try to compute this. And suppose that uh, in the, there is an index ij, uh, ijkl, for example. And, and then we knew the law, law from, from the final diagram, which is that whenever there is a vertex, there should be a structure constant. So, uh, so if there is a, if I double this dummy index by A, for example, then what you should have is that uh, there is a structure constant, I, J, I, K, A. Uh, well, maybe I should write it here so that the correspondence is super clear. And then here I have uh, A, well, already say I anti-symmetrize everything, for example, thing like this. So the answer, at least, without uh, doing much complicated computations, well, the comp whole computation is not, not complicated, but. Uh, so, so the answer is the Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, OK. I didn't say explicitly, but let's take a uh, uh, gauge group T. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, the point is that it's, it's general. Yes. Oh, yes, that's right. A is an index in the general Yeah. Uh, well, well, okay, sorry. It, so, sorry, sorry. Yeah, okay. So maybe I shouldn't use the notation A, A, A or anything like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's right. That's right. And then, you know, this looks like it's an. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, right. So, so these are in some representation. So this is in the presentation R and the presentation R prime, for example. Uh, there could be different representations, for example. And A is a joint. Yes, A is a joint, right. Right. And then what you obtain is that, uh, so this R, uh, thank, but thank you for asking. I didn't, in fact, say <laughs> explicitly. Yes. So you, you can easily see, see that this should take the form of ZA, TA, for example, TA prime, uh, IJ, for example. Uh, IJ, let's see. Uh, yeah, uh, in this, sorry, IK. J L, for example, where T A's are the representative sort of generators for the so A is the joint index and I I J etc are the indices of representation. Well, this could be the same representation, but I wrote a straight different a general expression where the two representations are different. So there should be such such group theory factor. And and then then, then well then uh, it turns out that. This is supplemented by a very simple factor, z minus w. Well, at least it's, it's OK with dimension-wise. As I said earlier, because the theory is unrealizable, this theory h bar has a dimension length. So at least it cancels the dimension. And uh, so this is a very simple answer. So in fact, it turns out the answer is exactly this. Uh, well, that requires computation, but it's very easy. Now, it turns out this is the element. The, the, this is the what we call the rational solution. Well, so here, uh, well, okay. So here, the construction. By, it looks by construction. Well, the actual subtlety speech I'm coming to, but by construction. Because we could do the perturbative expansion h bar, so the R matrix is quasi classical. And this expansion R is this uh, classical R matrix. What's called the classical R matrix. And uh, in particular, this classical R matrix satisfies some equation. Well, of course, the, there is a full quantum Yanbach's equation. So if you expand in H, well, if you expand this way, and then take the term of all H squared, there will be a relation. And the relation is that R12, U, and R3, V, 
uh, okay, maybe I save, to save time, this, let's type as a sum, u plus b plus uh, r to uh, one three, r one, uh, one uh, two three. So this is the young box equation, but uh, h bar limit of young box equation uh, known as the classical young box equation. And, uh, and people have found uh, the simplest solution of this classical young box equation is this one. So we have reproduced this, uh, this uh, uh, classical R matrix. Now, there is a very interesting mathematical, so this is about the classical R matrix, but there is a very interesting mathematical result due to Dreamfield saying that uh, if you know the position, right, so right, basically if you know uh, this classical R matrix, then uh, by using the young equation, equation, uh, you actually know, so, so then you suppose that you have uh, uh, two classical R matrices, uh, sorry, suppose that I have two quantum R matrices here. Uh, satisfy the Yambach equation, and let's do the expansion, and then obtain two classical R matrices. But suppose that we find that the two classical R matrices are the same, and then uh, and it turns out that uh, the, the full quantum R matrix is actually the same. So uh, so this reproduces the classical R matrix, but if we could resort to a hit general statement, uh, we actually know about the full quantum. Uh, R matrix, which is interesting as a statement in uh, perturbative quantum field theory, because otherwise you have to do perturbation order by order. Uh, but if you take advantage of this structure, uh, the full structure, uh, full perturbative series can be computed uh, from the full R matrix, which is computed by universal R matrix. Result says yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right, yes. Can you have non Sorry? Can you have well, non perturbative corrections. Uh, uh, I see. Well, uh, hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. At least it's a. Yeah, right. So it's a finite series? Right, right. right. Yeah, I don't think there are any instant tones and things like that. So. Yeah. But uh, I don't think there are instant tones, et cetera. And, right. So I think so, so that's a physical argument. But I believe that if you look into the argument of Dreamfield, probably it's, it might be somewhere there implicitly. That, 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 that I'm not so sure. Maybe some people in the audience might know. Sorry. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so this is, uh, well, so uh, at least we have already derived this uh, simplest uh, classical R matrix. Uh, this was essentially there already. This was there already in the Costello's paper from 2013. But here uh, we are using a more elementary approach, which is easier to understand for uh, quantum field theories. So you have another proof of vehicles here, or no? Okay, that that I don't know. Right. Yeah. So that 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 requires the understanding the full part of part of the series, right? So but about the corrections to these, for example. And that seems hard, in fact, right? Are the closed formula for the full quantum R matrix? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think so, right. So it's just there is a prediction for Yeah, there is a prediction for part of So I think at least you can go, yeah, I, we are just lazy, but you can go to high loop, one loop, two loop, et cetera, and then this should match, for example. That, that's a very, yeah, that's very convincing check. Perhaps I should do at least one loop, for example. <laughs> <laughs> Right, <laughs> maybe find a graduate to do the two loop or something. <laughs> Anyways, I'm joking. But, yeah. so, sorry, yes? Well, yeah, it should be, at least order by order. Order by order. Yeah, 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 that's right, that's right, yes. And, uh, right, but, oh, sorry, but in fact, right, so, sorry, but maybe I should say that I realized that I haven't told you the most crucial part, which is that, uh, well, okay, so we already explained the integral of the R matrix, but why is the theory, why do we obtain the solution to the Young equation? Sorry, I haven't said that. 
<laughs> which is a very most important part. Sorry, I almost forgot that. that that's the problem of doing the Blackboard talk. I forget what I'm supposed to talk about. Uh, and uh, <laughs> right, so so what what is the well? So Yambach's equation graphically means that uh, that there are uh, three different lines, for example, and uh, I could change the relative position like this, for example. And and usually, well, you have to go through these continuities co co coming from here to there because it's a two-dimensional picture, and obviously there is a point where everything, uh, there is a three-point intersection, which is singular. However, but first of all, here we have the spectral parameters, ZW and ZW, for example, and ZW. So although in this frame, this topological frame, it looks like that they're, they're on the, uh, uh, well, they might, int when you change it, for example, there is a triple intersection, but actually on this, uh, on this frame, on the other frame, holomorphic frame, where the spectral parameter leaves. Well, first of all, they are at the different points. So even when it looks like that everything coming together and everything is singular, first of all, they are still far away in the uh, extra dimensional direction. And besides, uh, well, the theory here in this along this direction is topological. So this is a top, was a topological frame. So it actually shouldn't matter uh, how, exactly how these lines are written. So the topological invariance, uh, topological, uh, that, that theory is the topological on this frame, together with the fact that they are separated in the, uh, in the complex frame, uh, sorry, expect the C, uh, the curve for the spectral parameter. So these two facts explain why, uh, the, if you compute these two, two uh, useful lines, they have the same explication value. And so, and then this was the Young Bach equation. So this is somewhat similar to the. Similar argument in not series. So, in the, namely, in the case of not series, there are three lines, and you change the relative position. That's right, minus a three. And, and the usual argument is that, that there is three D covariance, and the series is topological, so you can change the position without any doing changing anything. And that was here. But here, you don't have a three D covariance, but uh, we have the uh, topological still have the topological invariance on the two plane, and and the cost we pay is that we don't distinguish between overcrossing and undercrossing, for example. So in node theory, we, we worry about whether it is overcrossing, undercrossing, that changes the knot, which is very crucial. But here it's a frame, so I don't have any distinction. So I lose some information of the knot, but as a compensation, I obtain the spectral parameter. So there is some inter intersection between the Young's integral model with the spectral parameter and the knot theory. Oh, oh. Yes, I, well, the time is almost over. Right, but yes. But let me just mention, well, uh, well should, uh, so far I only reproduced this, so maybe some people might be disappointed. <laughs> but <laughs> but let, let me, let me uh, yeah, spend two, two or three, two minutes maybe uh, explaining what the general result is. But in fact, uh, I, we believe that, the, that this uh, framework is very general. We can change very groups, etc. <coughs> representation. So hopefully we could reproduce uh, quite a bit of the aspects of the integral models. And at least one, one, result, one result, for example, I can tell you in the two minutes, I guess, is that uh, there is a classification of integral classical R metrics, R classification, uh, due to Berabi and Greenfield. Uh, and well, the precise theorem is a little bit more complicated, but uh, roughly speaking, the statement is that classical R matrix comes with three types, rational, trigonometric, and uh, elliptic. What this means is that in practice, R matrix is in some polynomial in Z, or some, it, it, well, some Z and X, for example. Yeah, but there's a for, polynomial or trigonometric, sine and cosine. And uh, here in this elliptic case, we have theta functions, for example. The R matrix is written in terms of these uh, functions, for example. And, and correspondingly, the spectral parameter 
lives on C, lives on C star, uh, lived on the elliptic curve. Now, there's a counterpart of this. Now, I think I only have one minute, but I could tell you in one minute, which is that uh, we could generalize the story a little bit. Well, okay, so far I was writing dz with Chan Simons A, but, uh, but in fact, that implicitly assumed that that was C, for example. Uh, complex plane. The sigma was a complex plane, and that was why I was writing ZZ with a differential Z. C is a uh, uh, holomorphic, yeah, holomorphic for that. Right. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I was writing, saying the wrong thing. Right. So this was used to be C. Sorry. Yes, thank you. But I could take C to be a different, uh, uh, different manifold. For example, I could take it to be C star or elliptic curve, for example. And then I take some differential. For example, in this case, there is a simple differential dz. In the C star case, there is a simple differential dz over z. And in this case, there is a differential dz. Well, these are uh, obvious canonical coordinates here. And I use this in the definition of the action. Well, so, so this is the one di differential. But, well, of course, then, then you can say that why don't you take a higher genus Lieberman surface, et cetera. Well, now the point is that this is not the complete classification of general R matrix, but classic R matrix. So namely, this is a situation for, oh, sorry, maybe I'm going over one minute, sorry, already, sorry. But let me <laughs> finish one minute. So this is a situation for, you can take a classic limit. So H bar goes to zero is applicable. So here, I have H bar. So namely, this is a parameter. So I could always take H bar to zero and discuss classic limit. However, the subtlety is that uh, there might be zeros, for example, of W, for example, uh, omega, omega here. Right? If there's a zero of omega, it's like sending h bar to infinity. So the semi-classical argument here doesn't apply. So the, it, it's an intrinsically quantum theory, at least near that point. And it's, it might be fine as a quantum theory, but it doesn't necessarily have a part of the expansion I was talking about, so it doesn't fit with this classification. So, uh, so I want the differential. Uh, but no zeros. And possibly poles. And it is the mathematical result that if you want a differential, a globally defined meromorphic differential on the surface uh, with no zeros, but possibly poles, these are only three possibilities. So number of zeros minus number of poles is the uh, 2G minus 2. And so in this case, for example, the pole, there are two poles, the order of two poles at infinity. In this case, the order of one pole at two points. So in this case, the, that number is two, for example. And in this case, the number is zero, for example. And that number goes to minus two, minus four, et cetera, if you go to higher genus, even surface. So, uh, so you can convince yourself that this is the uh, only possibility. And that, that matches nicely with the uh, classical R matrix, for example. Now, the dream, dream well, okay, so maybe I should really finish, but the dream field service simple says more, for example, you cannot really find a solution to a, a, uh, a, well, other than a, a n case in the elliptic cases, for example. And there is a counterpart of that here that the bundle module has parameter, et cetera. But anyway, so this is uh, one small thing, and, uh, but uh, we, we are working on other aspects, and hopefully we could explain uh, various results in the integral models from this uh, four-dimensional gate theory approach.